Hello everybody. Uh, thank you for joining this talk. Uh, this talk consists of two parts. In the first part, I would like to talk about the security, mainly security features that latest key clock supported. Also, try to support in the future. Then, in the second part, the Thomas will demonstrate the <coughs> potential integration of key grow with open policy agent. So let's start now my part. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, before my talk, let me introduce myself to you briefly. My name is Takashi Norimatsu, the key clock maintainer and also working at Hitachi Limited Japan. I have been contributing mainly security features to Kikro. For example, the WCC web authentication API support, and some the supporting or complying with the RFC standard documentation specification, and also OSI 2 based API security profile support to Kikro as follows. Uh, as you may know, the key clock is identity and access management open source software. Also, the CNCF incubating project since, the, since last year. The key clock provides the rich, rich features and also supporting the several open standard for authentication and authorization. Uh, in my part, I would like to talk about the following items, topics. The pass keys, OS 2.1 and uh, OID for VCI. So let's move on to the first topic, pass keys. Uh, pass keys allows us to authenticate ourselves. Uh, without using password instead of using password uh, using the cryptographic key. Then uh, there are two types of pass key, the synced pass key and device bound pass key. Also two types of authentication, the cross device authentication and same device authentication. So the Kigro 23 starts supporting these pass key authentication features. However, the from technological point of view, the pass key authentication is the same the roughly the same as web awesome authentication that Keygroup had already uh, start, uh, supported since the version 8. But nowadays, the, it seems that passkey authentication are common now because the passkey authentication are supported by the major, uh, several major platforms as follows. So just as just mentioned before, the, there are two types of passkey, synced passkey and device-bound passkey. Uh, the device-bound passkey is uh, bound with your the own device, single device. While the synced passkey is bound with your the major IDP identity providers, the user account. For example, the Google account and Apple ID. So therefore, the you can share pass synced pass key among your own several devices by using the cloud services synchronization. For example, the Google password manager and Apple iCloud keychain. Also, as just mentioned before, there are two types of authentication. 
、えー、same device authentication and cross device authentication.、Uh, let's assume that you use your PC and try to authenticate yourself to the authentication server with pass key. In same device authentication, you need to use the pass key created and installed onto your PC. While in closed device authentication, you, need,、uh, you can use the pass key created and installed onto your smart device. Uh, not necessarily the ones created and installed on your PC. Then, the before you using password authentication in Keygroup, you need to register your passkey in advance. After that, the Keygroup provides、uh, two options for authentication passwordless authentication and Loginless authentication. In passwordless authentication, you need to input your identity information onto Keycloak, for example, the username or email address, and so on. After that, you use your passkey to authenticate yourself. While in loginless authentication, you only simply use your passkey. To authenticate yourself to Keycloak. So, the next, the Thomas will demonstrate the Keycloak passkey registration and authentication. Yep.、Yeah. Thank you, Takashi. So, then let's move on to our first demo.、Um, second. For this, I prepared a Keycloak、uh, realm here, and we have a user who currently has only a password set. Yeah. So, now let's Uh, open up an application and log in as that user. So, see, now we see the new uh, account, uh, self service account management console provided by Keycloak. And if we scroll to the bottom, we can now say, oh, please register a passkey here. And this leads us to the following screen where the user can now click on register. And then the browser native dialog will pop up. I could now register a passkey via my phone. For this, I needed to enable Bluetooth, but unfortunately, my fingerprint sensor just broke two days ago, so I will use a different method. So, here I can, could scan this QR code, or I can now use my YubiKey that I installed in the system, which I now touch. And、uh, if everything works well, yeah, it should be detected. The YubiKey could be named somehow, whatever. And now my Web Authent Authenticator or Passwordless Authenticator mechanism is registered. If I now log out、uh, and provide the username information again,、um, I get first prompted with the password, but I now can select try another way. And now we say passkey, sign in passkey, and do the same thing as before. And in this case, I press the YubiKey authenticator again, and now I'm signed in. But we want to have truly passwordless, right? So for this, I now go to the user. And to just delete the password. <laughs> By the way, if you know the crypto, crypto keys for the passwordless devices that you give to、uh, your users, you can register that via API and remove the passwords and completely start passwordless from the get go. So if I now click on sign in, it just asks me for my passkey, which I can then provide in the same way. And if I hit the right spot, I'm logged in without a password. And It's that easy. So, with that said, let's get back to the presentation and over to you. Thank you. So, let's get back to my presentation.、Uh, next topic is OS 2.1 authorization framework.、Uh, OS 2.1 is next version of OS 2.0 authorization framework. Defined by RC6749 and 6750. The OS 2.1 is still the internet draft version. However, the OS 2.1 hardens the security aspect of existing OS 2.0 authorization framework. Then, the Keycloak 24 starts supporting this OS 2.1. 
Then the OS 2.1 provides the several the security features. That today I'd like to pick up one of them, the preventing misuse of stolen and leak access token. So let's assume that you use your client application and use the Keycloak as an authorization server. That both follows the OS 2.0. Then the, your client application receives an access token from a key clock. Then an attacker steals your access token and try to access an API with this access token. Then this access will succeed because the OS 2.0 defines an access token as bearer token. The bearer token allows everybody holding an access token can use the access token. The therefore, an attacker that holding other current applications access token can use this access token. To prevent this misuse of this access token, OS 2.0, as well as OS 2.1, allows us to make an access token, the uh, sender constrained token. The sender constrained token only allows a legitimate client application to use this access token for accessing the APIs and so on. So therefore, an attacker that steals other client application access token cannot use this access token. Then, the OS 2.1 that provide two options for realizing this uh, center constraint access token. The first option is RFC 8705, OS 2 MTLS. And the second option is RFC 9449, OS 2 demonstrating profile position called DPOP. Then the Keycloak had already supported this option one. And the Keycloak newly supported the option two, DPOP, uh, since the version 23. And the DPOP uh, might be uh, suitable for the public client application, while the option one, also MTLS, is, might be suitable for confidential client application. Then finally, I'd like to talk about the emerging paradigm of identity management to Keycloak. So as you might hear the word or concept self-vained identity uh, called SSI, in the SSI, instead of the major the identity provider, the subject itself can manage and control their identity information and any kind of their attributes. To realize this SSI, the decentralized ID, DID, uh, might be the viable option. To realize this DID, there are several uh, open standards. The, among them, the World Web, World Web Consortium published the Verifiable Credentials Data Model V2. Uh, in this data model, uh, this data model defines mainly the major four roles, issuer, holder, verifier, and subject. Holder might be called as wallet. The subject holds this holder, and the issuer uh, provides the holder the, with verifiable credentials that include this subject identity information and any kind of this subject, the attributes. After that, the subject can pick up the sum of the claims included in this verifiable credentials to create a new verifiable presentation. Then the holder presents this verifiable presentation to verifier. So therefore, in this model, the subject can uh, control the which kind of user identity information and attribute uh, could be uh, disclosed onto which 
verify your application. Then there are several open standards to support this data model. Now the key group is focusing on the Open ID Connect extensions among them. To say more precisely, the key group committee is trying to support Open ID for verifiable credentials insurance called OID for BCI to key group. The key group committee now try to uh, make key group as an issuer in this data model. And therefore, Keycloak need to support this OID for BCI. Then, uh, so the motivation for this work is that European Commission published the documentation European Digital Identity Wallet Architecture Reference Framework. Uh, this framework describes that OID for BCI must be implemented by non issuer in this framework. So if Keycloak can support the OID for BCI, then we can use Keycloak as an issuer in this framework in EU. So the, such kind of the activity for supporting OID for BCI, uh, OS 2.1, pass here and so on, were ma uh, mainly conducted by OS 6, the Keycloak community activity. Uh, if you are interested in this activity, I would be, we would be very happy if you join this activity. Then that's all for my part. Thank you very much for your listening. The next. Yeah. Thanks, Takashi. So now let's move on with the second part and we'll, we'll keep it brief and I'll show mostly my demo. <laughs> so it's about flexible authorization with Keycloak. My name is Thomas. Uh, I currently work for a consultancy called Concentric. I have also, like Sakashi, I'm an official Keycloak maintainer and I have been a Keycloak contributor for many, many years and I'm just a random nerd loving Keycloak. So like many of you probably also. So, if you already are using Kiko for a while, you know that uh, Kiko authorization in Kiko comes in many forms and shapes. Um, for instance, we have role-based access control. Uh, we are uh, the roles that we can express in Kiko on realm or client level. Uh, there are dedicated roles for doing specific things in the realm management uh, or with the Kiko REST APIs. We also have support for fine-grained admin permissions that give us more control over management of RAM resources, like which uh, member of a group can manage other members of that same group uh, or other groups and so on. And that's all based on these authorization services. The authorization services in Keycloak is in fact its own subsystem for, that allows you to form flexible access control policies with a lot of built-in rules with JavaScript support and also an SPI that allows you to plug in your own custom logic. However, there are also some custom community extensions available that allow you to, for instance, restrict access to a client with standard Java code or JavaScript even, or uh, completely with a declarative configuration approach, right? And the following, uh, I will also concentrate on that use case. How can we restrict access to certain applications from the Keycloak side already? So, uh, for this, I have a few requirements uh, for authorization. Uh, for instance, I want to be able to define policies via code, uh, for instance, the set client access rules, and I want to be able to validate and test those policies, in the best case, even outside of Keycloak. I also want to be able to change policies easily and to be able to trace and follow policy decisions afterwards. So the question is, how can we achieve that? Well, one obvious answer is, of course, open policy agent uh, that gives us these capabilities. Open Policy Agent, as many of you might probably know already, uh, is an open source policy engine written in Go uh, that allows you to evaluate policies, validate policies, and uh, supports various ways of transporting policies to the actual evaluation. Uh, like you can have a push or push configuration to a policy agent, or you can pull configure to pull information from a certain source. Um, this tool is ma mainly developed by a company called Styra Inc. and uh, is also a CNCF project. And uh, uh, propagates a model of writing policies as code. 
which enables us to write our complete authorization logic as plain source code as we are used to, instead of configuring it uh, with some options on a UI or something like that. Yeah? This gives us the possibility to version our policy code, lint it, test it, refactor it, audit it, and run it in, in the end. Uh, in order to do this, uh, they provide a dedicated declarative policy language called Rego, in which you would model your access logic, which I will show you in a second. Uh, there are multiple usage options for Open Policy Agent. You can use it as a library in your Go application if you haven't. Have an, or the most common use case is to run it as a sidecar along your application, let's say, and speak with it via HTTP or gRPC interfaces. How does it work? Well, you have your service, your application, or whatever, and you have OPA as a sidecar, and whenever your service receives a request, an event, or something like that that you want to authorize, um, this event, uh, this uh, application, which through some kind of integration creates some kind of an access query or policy query in a JSON format. This is then sent to OPA, and the OPA sidecar has uh, some information like the current policy logic loaded into memory together with some data maybe, but you could also access data from another other source. Then the Open Policy Agent will evaluate this access request and will get return a decision, and this decision has to be then enforced by your application, like whether to, you allow the access or not. So, as I said, um, this is all backed by a declarative policy language um, that is more, more or less inspired by a, a language called Datalog, and what you define there in this language is uh, you define policies, which are effectively collections of rules. And a rule is effectively a, a, co a named collection of conditions. And conditions are, of course, Boolean expressions or arbitrary calculations that uh, form your access, form your policy logic. Um, there are some implicit variables available, like you can refer to data that you receive in the access request via input, and uh, you can access arbitrary data that is available in Open Policy Agent via data. Um, there are also many built-in functions, for instance, to decode a JOT or pass JSON, or even check whether an IP address is in a certain CIDR range. Yeah? Just to give you a brief impression, uh, impression how such a policy looks like, yeah? this is Rigo, the Rigo language, and effectively says that we have two rules here uh, with the same name. We have a default uh, rule called allow, which says false. By default, we deny all access. And uh, for a specialization of that, we have a rule that, okay, we allow access if the HTTP request is, uh, of method is get and the path is public somehow. Yeah? These are the conditions behind uh, the rule here. This, and those conditions are all combined by AND, via AND, the logical operator AND by default. So now the question is, how can we do leverage that uh, in Keycloak? Well, the idea is, we could use Keycloak as a so-called PEP, which is called a policy enforcement point, which basically enforces the policy decision that gets presented by OPA. And OPA serves as the so-called policy decision point. So OPA has the logic and gets the access queries requests and responds with uh, yeah, access allowed or denied uh, responses. And we would use Rego to define access policies in Keycloak. But you will see this approach is not just limited to access control logic. We can also use that for implementing fine-grained admin permissions, yeah? or allow or reject identity brokering uh, interactions. Or we could even use this as protocol mappers for our uh, tokens or some uh, artifacts. Yeah? Um, and we can also manage access for custom endpoint. And, but what I will focus on now is just implementing client access checks. And for this, we have the following model. Uh, we have our user who lives in a realm called OPA Demo um, in Keycloak that serves as a PEP. Keycloak is in this case equipped with an OPA extension, a small uh, extension that is uh, written in Java and added to the Keycloak server. Um, and Keycloak will also contain a resource like our app that we want to access, a client. And um, yeah, Keycloak is configured with this extension to be able to send access queries to OPA and uh, uh, inter interpret the access decision afterwards. So how does it look like? So imagine um, we have an OPA uh, server running and we now want to access a certain application in a realm. Uh, then we would basically uh, invoke a URL uh, from on the OPA side. Um, and this is a so-called policy URL, and with this policy path, we would basically um, select which kind of access logic we want to execute. 
Yeah? And you see here, I have this format realm policy and what kind of rule I want to intercept. Yeah? And an access policy effectively could look like this. Yeah? By default, we allow nothing. And in case we have a client with the client ID app, uh, we check whether the current user has the current role access for that client. If this is the case, we allow access. Otherwise, we deny it. Yeah? And uh, yeah, this is basically the interaction that we would have. Here we have the input. Uh, when we try to access the application, we create the following the shape of a, a access query. We say the following subject with the username tester, the user ID, and this realm roles, client roles, and attributes wants to access a resource of the current realm with the client ID app. Um, and here are some additional metadata. And Open Policy Agent will run that policy that I showed earlier and then return a result, access allowed, yes or no. Yeah? That's it. And as a side effect, it will also uh, generate a so-called decision ID that allows me to track this access decision, uh, whether this was su uh, successful or not. Yeah? So now enough slides. Now it's time for a demo. Um, here I have another Keycloak realm. Uh, and if I log in to, for instance, this application here with the user tester, you see I can exit it straight away, and it works as expected. Now let's enable access checks. So for this, and there are many ways to implement this. In this case, I use a required action, which is executed whenever a browser interaction happens with a user, uh, whether it is, the first, is an authenticated user or user is, or after authentication. Yeah, just enable that. And if I try to access it again, you see access denied. So what happens under underneath? Well, uh, the following access query was basically issued. And uh, with the given input policy query, uh, the following subject, username tester with the following realm roles, wants to access the resource in this realm with the client ID. Yeah? And the user came from this particular IP address with this protocol and whatever. And the access decision was false. Uh, so why was this the case? So if we look at the policy that sits behind that, we see that, again, by default, our policy says allow false. And now uh, the OPA or the Rego language is built in such a way that the most specific rule that applies to the given input is selected. In this case, it tries to select uh, the rule here uh, that we define. It's our client ID is account console. And you see that I require that the user has the role user, which apparently is currently not present here. So now let's just assign that role to the user. and. Just like that, give it a roll. So, and if I now try again to access this uh, application, okay. access will succeed because now the input query document contains the rule that is required and the access is now allowed. So far, so good. So you see, simple example. Um, and just to show you a bit what's, what could be possible or how such a, an access policy could look like, and this is in fact an access policy for a particular client, yeah? you just write some rules with a, so a self-made DSL yet you, that you build on top of the primitives that Rego provides you with. Yeah? In this case, uh, I can check whether a user has, for app one, whether the user has a certain client role for the same client. Uh, or could be also a different client role that we check. Uh, here's an example where I check whether the user has the role access for the current client, which is app2 in this case. But I could also check whether the user is a member of a group um, or uh, not. Uh, I could also target uh, a, an arbitrary number of clients, not only a specific client with a specific client ID, but I could also leverage um, um, uh, open policies uh, support for expressing something like or, <laughs> right? Which is, if you're familiar with open policy agent, you know uh, open policy agent has so, a somehow um, strange relationship with a condition operator or. <laughs> and is built in by default and super easy to use, but or for, in order to express or, you have to do all sorts of tricks, which can be read in this interesting blog post. Uh, and this is one way to do it. So you can basically create policies, access policies across multiple, and apply policies across multiple applications. 
And here's something uh, special. Here, for instance, I have a policy that checks whether the current user comes from a certain CIDR network range. Yeah? And you might wonder, how is this implemented underneath, like the other functions as well? Well, for this, you see that I always use this KC dot, uh, reference object here, which I just import uh, as another uh, policy module, so to speak. And here, I have all this, uh, let's say, DSL, my custom functions expressed based built on top of uh, Rego primitives. Um, for instance, the, the network check effectively call, uses a uh, Rego function called net CIDR contains, which allows me to check the network range and so on. And there, you can imagine there are hundreds of original functions that you can have. And the idea is, um, if you build your own abstractions on top of Rego, um, then you can give your developer teams an easy to use DSL uh, at hand that enables them to express access decisions and policy logic in an easy way without having to learn all the nitty gritty details about Rego. Yeah? You provide them just with a simple DSL, um, an embedded DSL that they can use. Yeah? Okay, now maybe some other uh, two more use cases. Uh, okay, I showed you some browser-based interactions uh, with, uh, for, for with access checks, but how, what, if, what if I want to use uh, an API call or something like that, or want to use other grant types, like for instance the grant type password or grant type client credentials. And if I make some room here, and if I, for instance, now send a request to this, uh, and this request, like a grant type password request uh, and grant type client credentials request, yeah? you see no check is performed at all with this method. Um, that's why uh, Keycloak um, does not so, um, has different ways uh, to check for different grants, let's say, um, what happens. And if you want to have checks here as well, we can leverage another cool feature that was contributed by Takashi, which is called client policies. Uh, so, in order to use that, we start first, we create a so-called client profile, which is called OPA uh, client access, uh, OPA check access profile. And here we select a so-called uh, OPA client access policy enforcer. Here we can select which kind of information we want to be added to a policy query, right? Which uh, user attribute, context attribute, RAM attribute, client attributes, whatever, when, whether we want to expose roles and so on and what kind of policy path we want to use. Yeah? And now, uh, to apply this po uh, profile, we need to create a so-called policy that tells us uh, to which clients uh, should this policy be applied. Yeah? And let's say conditions, we say, please apply to just any client for now. And uh, here we say, uh, we link that to our OPA check access profile. And the steps are on the slides that I uploaded, so don't worry, you can watch it later on. Um, so now I created this, uh, collected this policy, and if I try to do the request again, yeah, you see here, uh -huh, OPA access check failed, four, three, forbidden. Why was this the case? Well, the access query was executed, um, and you see here the grant type was password in this case, and the, uh, the, the access was denied. Why was that the case? Um, because in our policy, um, as said, it, uh, the policy access logic must explicitly match the client in this case, yeah, which didn't, and therefore it fall back to the, fell back to the uh, allow deny or allow false rule by default. So if I make the, this method match, and now you can imagine I changed the code, I committed it, I linted it, I pushed it, uh, the CI pipeline kicked in, build it again, and whatever. Uh, uh, either pushed it into my open policy agent uh, servers, server, uh, agents, or provided an endpoint that the policy agent could, pop, could uh, pull from, right, periodically. And now my policy would, is live. And if I try again to call the endpoint, now it succeeds. Yeah. I got a token and so on. And here you also see request was performed and this time it says result true. That's it. Yeah? So that's all I wanted to show for now and all I have time for. Um, the cool thing about this, as I said earlier, I want also to be able to test the policies, right? And you can just do that with the built-in OPA test functionality. You basically create, uh, define your, your example input queries, so to speak, with the bare information that you want to provide. And then you can 
create arbitrary asserts around that, yeah, and so on. And with that, you can basically test your access rules without kicklock, <laughs> yeah, just uh, by, the, by using the built-in tooling, and so on. Okay, this concludes my demo. There's a lot more slides available in the in the in the uploaded form. Exactly. Thanks. Um, to summarize, uh, you see, you've seen the uh, simple integration of Open Policy Agent and Keycloak. Uh, code is all on GitHub. Link is, is in the next slide. Um, you see that access decisions can be delegated to OPA with this, but enforced by Keycloak. And you might wonder, hmm, why, do, why should I do that? Uh, usually, uh, these access decisions are also enforced on the application side. Of course, you still have to do that, like validating on the front end, on the back end. Yeah, we have to do it somehow on both sides. But if Keycloak knows that an access is denied, we can also analyze why. For instance, maybe the user is missing a role, and then we can add a process to Keycloak that says that, okay, you cannot currently access this application because you're missing that role or you are not a member of the group. Click here to request that role or click here to request joining that group. And then you can kick off arbitrary management processes that uh, lever uh, yeah, let someone grant you access to that. And later on, you can try it again. That's possible when Keycloak knows that the access is denied based on that. Yeah. Also, these mechanisms allow us uh, flexible policy management via GitOps, as you've seen. Yeah? I just edited code, and whatever you want and can do with code, you can do. And uh, also, in my experience, this also helps to consolidate existing access logic, because you, as you've seen with uh, small helper functions that I wrote, you could also wrote, uh, write uh, building blocks of access control logic that are shared across applications that you can reuse for the same purpose, yeah? and so on. And that's all I have. With that, I say thank you. Okay. Um, code is on GitHub. You can find it there. If you have feedback to our talk, you can scan the QR code. And I think we have two minutes for questions. And uh, if you have questions, uh, some folks will bring, bring Mike. Or the, the, some, the, yes, the Mike. Hello. Hello. Hey. Does this in any way affect or relate UMA in uh, Keycloak, maybe? Do you mean user managed access? Yes. Um, this could be leveraged in that regard as well, let's say, to, to write uh, logic uh, to, to enforce uh, user managed access. But uh, in this prototype, on this example, that's not uh, part of it. Yeah? OK. Uh, other questions? Can I go on? So, if there are no more questions, feel free to uh, yeah speak to us. We will stay stick here around for a while. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening.